Welcome to another edition of Kayfabe Commentary. My name is Eric Rupp and I am your host. And on this edition of the show, we are going to be talking about NWA Power Episode 20, Stand and Defend. And as usual, there was a ton of stuff going on on NWA Power. For this one, I got to tell you, though, I liked the episode. I liked it a lot, but there was just something off. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is, but there was just something a little bit off. It wasn't as special as most of the other episodes of NWA Power have been. NWA Power, at this point, I'd probably give 16 of the previous 19 episodes, I'd give them A's. I'd give them a grade of A. And with three more, I'd probably give a grade of B. This one, I don't know what I give it. I'm just... it. There's something that wasn't quite right, something missing, and I don't know quite what it was. Maybe we'll figure it out over the course of the show, but this was still a good episode, but not quite right. Now, the show certainly opened and closed really well. And the opening match featured Ricky Starks defending his television championship against Zicky. Where's my daddy back? Dice. And the match was actually really good. This was a really good match. And Zicky Dice kind of took a more laid-back approach to the match, meaning he didn't feel rushed. Despite the 6-minute and 5-second time limit, he wrestled his match, turning it into his kind of fight. And ultimately, he ended up getting the upset win and becoming your outlandish television champion for the NWA. Ricky Starks, for his part, seemed shocked. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get another match between these two down the line because Ricky Starks was one heck of a television champion. And I know for a fact that he will be back in the title mix, either for that title, the national title, or down the line, the world's heavyweight championship. But he's going to be challenging for one of those titles before too long. Ricky Starks is absolutely too good not to be in that championship mix. Okay, so one match down, so far so good. The show is looking good, and as Zicky Dice is giving his, for lack of a better term, his acceptance speech at the podium with Dave Marquez, Tom Latimer comes out and chases him away and demands that Joe Galley come to the podium because he wants to talk to Joe Galley face-to-face. Galley, for his part really doesn't want to go over there. Stu Bennett doesn't want any part of Tom Latimer. But Joe Galley, suck it up, man. You're a journalist, but not just a journalist. You're not just a regular journalist. You are also a wrestling commentator. So suck it up. Go over there. Face Tom Latimer. I mean, what's he going to do? Beat you up? That doesn't seem to be what he wants to do. He wants to scare you. He wants to intimidate you. And probably with good reason. Let's face it. Joe Galley has been fixated on Camille for a long time. Now, he's kind of let it go for a while and focused on other things. But he was super fixated on Camille for the longest time. And as Camille's boyfriend, Tom Latimer got a little irritated with that. And that's, you know what? Let's be fair. That's understandable. But you know what? Joe Galley has got to stand up and do the job. Do the right thing. Don't go over there like a timid little kid who's scared. He's going to get in trouble. He's got his hands up. Don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Come on, Joe. Now, for Tom Latimer's part, he's telling Joe that Camille is finally going to say something on the next episode of Power. He's saying that Camille is going to speak. Now, does anybody really believe that i mean sure it could be true it could be true but why do i think that tom latimer and camille are going to be pulling a fast one on us kind of like lucy holding the football for charlie brown we're going to go for the kick end up flying through the air flat on our backs with the wind knocked out of us Something tells me there's something else going on, and we're going to find out on the next episode of Power. But this segment kind of left me, I don't know. Joe, you can't be so scared. Stand up to Latimer. What's the worst thing he's going to do, beat you up? I mean, seriously. I don't know. That just that segment was kind of hit or miss for me. And, I, you know, I don't know quite how I feel about it. What do you think? 
If you've got some feelings about it, feel free to post your comments below. But I'll tell you what, that yeah, that's not a bad segment. It was not a bad segment, but it kind of left me wanting something else, something more, and I don't know what that would have been. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about Aaron Stevens either. I mean, let's face it. Aaron Stevens may have the sharpest wit of anybody in the NWA, but he's not the best wrestler, and he didn't earn that national championship. He only won that national championship because the question mark hit Colt Cabana with the Mongrovian spike. Aaron Stevens didn't win that title, And furthermore, he's ducked people who should be getting title shots. He's run away from people, and he's used a short time limit to hang on to that title. Aaron Stevens is not a legitimate national champion for the NWA. But you can't help but love the guy. He is just so funny. He's got such a great razor-sharp wit. And the segment he had with David Marquez, Aaron Stevens had a really good segment another one i mean let's face it aaron stevens is gold on the mic he may not be gold in the ring he may not have earned the gold he wears around his waist but he is gold on the mic and he brought out the rock and roll express because he and the question mark want a shot at the tag team titles and he believes that a win over the rock and roll express will catapult them to being legitimate title contenders Now, I don't think for a second that Aaron Stevens and the question mark can beat Eli Drake and James Storm. I just don't see that happening unless they cheat. And of course, that's not beyond the two of them. So but unless they cheat, they cannot legitimately beat Storm and Drake. They just can't do it. And this segment, it was good. But the Rock and Roll Express, I don't know. They weren't quite up to their usual high standards. Ricky Morton is also gold on the mic. And this time he was just good. It'll be interesting to see what happens going forward, but I don't think you're going to see the Rock and Roll Express lie down the way Aaron Stevens was implying that they should as they work out some kind of deal. But we'll see. We'll see on the next episode of Power. One guy I really like is Caleb Conley. Now, he is a really good wrestler, a younger wrestler who has been around for a little while, but he's still on the younger side of things, and he is still a rising star. He's still coming up in the business, and I'll tell you something. Caleb Conley is one of those guys that hasn't had as much of a chance to really fully show what he could do in the NWA, and I've been hoping to see more of him. But then he's involved in a last chance match, teaming up with C.W. Anderson against the Dawsons. And the loser in this match would not have their contracts renewed. So basically, whoever loses is out of the NWA. The Dawsons, they're a tough team. They came on. They were in the first match on NWA Power. They are one big, strong, monstrous team. But they have not had a lot of luck lately. So this was their last chance, along with Caleb Conley and C.W. Anderson, their last chance as well. Now, the interesting thing about this match is it was a tornado rules match, which means everybody's legal all the time. And that leads to chaos. And this is coming off of the last episode, Strictly Chaos, which had a ton of chaos. So it just kind of fits in. And this was, again, a really good match. And it was something where... You found yourself rooting, most likely, I know I did, but I found myself rooting for Caleb Conley and C.W. Anderson because Conley is a guy that I see as a potential champion down the line. He has a lot of talent. The thing I like about Caleb Conley is he is an old-school wrestler with modern high-flying ability. So he can do it all. He's got everything. He is the total package. He can do everything everything he can wrestle he can fly he can fight he has a ton of talent and a ton of potential and i fully believe somewhere down the line he is going to be a champion 
C.W. Anderson is a grizzled veteran who's been around a while, but he's got a lot left in the tank, and he looked good too. He's looked good in his matches here at the NWA, and I'll tell you what, when the match was over, it was the Dawsons on the short end of the stick, and they find themselves without a contract with the NWA. Now, does that mean we've seen the last of the Dawsons in the NWA? Or do they continue on without a contract just coming in and having one-off matches? I don't know. I like the Dawsons. They are a legitimate tag team. Being brothers, they work well together. But you know what? Right now, I got to say, I'm on Team Caleb Conley. So I want to see where he goes from here. And it was nice to see him get the win with C.W. Anderson so he can move on. And hopefully we see Caleb Conley get a title shot. Okay. Now, I want to be clear on one thing. I like Mae Valentine. Mae Valentine seems like a very nice person. She's very sweet. She's kind. Uh, if you read her Twitter posts, when she tweets stuff out, she seems like a really nice person. But she has been a horrible influence on Sal Renaro. What the hell has happened to Sal Renaro? This is a guy who was starting to make a name for himself. When he got hurt, so his arms hurt, and he's out. And for whatever reason, he's been hanging out with Mae Valentine. And now he's working on her vlog, and worse yet, he's working on her lingerie line? What the f***? What is up with that, Sal? Good God. What has happened to Sal Renaro? I mean, let's face it. None of his opponents, when he gets healed, none of his opponents are going to take him seriously in the ring. He will intimidate no one. You look at the way he's handling the situation here. When you've had Royce Isaacs come out and take him to task, he looks like a wimp. He can't do anything. I don't care if your arm's broken, Sal. Stand up for yourself. Don't let him push you around and threaten to break your other damn arm. Do something. If I were Sal Renaro's manager, I'd be slapping him upside the head and telling him to man up and to look like a tough guy because he's got to get in the ring against guys who want to tear his head off. And he is going to intimidate no one. This is what I've been saying and what's going to happen going forward. He is not an imposing figure when he's hanging out with Mae Valentine and talking about her lingerie line that he's working on. Good grief, this is ridiculous. Sal, man up. It's time to take it seriously. You are a pro wrestler. This is the NWA. This is the big time. You need to get tough. You need to rehab. You need to focus on getting back in that ring and tearing it up inside that ring. And right now, Sal, you're not doing that. Finally, we get to the main event of this episode of Power. And it's a tag team title match between your champions, James Storm and Eli Drake, and their challengers from Ring of Honor, the Bouncers. Now, the Bouncers are huge. These guys are monstrously big. I mean, you've got the Beer City Bruiser, who's a big guy, and then Brian Malonis, who's just absurdly big. I mean, he can barely move, but he's really strong, and he's extremely hard to pin. So that makes them a very formidable team because even the biggest, toughest, most skilled tag team is going to have a hard time getting him down, and the Beer City Bruiser isn't much smaller. But before the match, they are led out to the podium to have an interview segment with Dave Marquez. And the Pope, who's leading them out, gives his statement. And I'll tell you what, the Pope is great on the mic. Pope is great on the mic, but he's still ducking Eddie Kingston. And it kind of makes you wonder why. Pope, in the past, has been a really good pro wrestler. And he clearly wants to be a manager. But does he still have what it takes to be a wrestler in the ring? He's certainly going after Eddie Kingston verbally, but he doesn't seem to want to back it up physically in the ring. And that's not a good look for him. It just isn't. Eddie Kingston, for his part, he's down for a match anytime, anywhere. Street fight doesn't matter to him. He wants the Pope. He wants him because he has just been disrespectful. And I'll tell you what, Kingston's right. He really should get his hands on Pope. Maybe it happens at the Crockett Cup. 
I've mentioned that before, and I think that would be a good solution. Have the NWA brass say, you know what? You aren't going to continue to do this without backing it up in the ring. Time to get in there with Eddie Kingston and settle this thing. And then we get to the match. So Eddie Kingston leads out the champions, James Storm and Eli Drake. And this match is everything you would expect it to be. This was a very physical match with Eli Drake and James Storm clearly being the more talented, the more skilled team. But neither one of them could pick up Brian Malonis as they were trying to slam him. Neither one of them could do that. And the Beer City Bruiser, they had only a slightly better time moving him around. So this was a match where it wasn't just going to be about physical strength. It was going to be about smarts, skills, and in-ring ability, actual wrestling ability. And that's something where there's, you know, I'll tell you what, there's a reason why Eli Drake and James Storm are the champions. These guys are veterans. They're not old, but they're veterans, and they know how to handle themselves in the ring against any kind of opponent, and that showed up in this match here. They really knew how to handle this match. Yeah, sure, they struggled at parts of the match. When you're going up against guys that big and they get their hands on you, you're going to have down spots. It's going to happen. You're going to have points at which they are manhandling you. But the thing is, the champs knew how to deal with it. They knew how to counter it, how to come back from it, and they ended up successfully defending their title. After the match was over, Eddie Kingston tried to get the Pope into the ring, and it looked for a second like the Pope might go for it, and we might get that confrontation in the ring that we've been wanting to see between Eddie Kingston and Pope But then Pope backed out at the last minute, walking away with the crowd kind of jeering him. And I'll tell you what, not a good look for Pope. Trying to run away from Eddie Kingston like that, not a good look at all. So we've gone over the whole episode, and I was saying up top how something felt off. It wasn't quite right. It wasn't quite as great as the other episodes have been. And I thought maybe after going through the whole show, kind of going match by match, promo by promo, maybe I'd figure out what it was. And I don't know if it was just really seeing the whole May Valentine, Sal Renaro thing, or just something being off with the Aaron Stevens Rock and Roll Express spot. I don't know what it was. I'm still not getting it. I still don't know. I still like the episode. I think it was a good episode. Going over it again, you know what? I'll say this is a very good episode. This was another B. This was a solid, above average for pro wrestling television presentation kind of episode. But it wasn't excellent. It wasn't at the very highest level like most episodes of Power have been. And maybe, maybe the NWA is just a victim of their own success. Maybe our expectations are so high, or maybe it's just me. Maybe my expectations are so high after most episodes of Power just being outstanding to have one that's merely very good where it seems like a disappointment in a way, and it feels like something is off. I don't know what to tell you, but I'll tell you this. The NWA is still hitting it out of the park because for an off episode, This was still really good and another really entertaining episode of NWA Power. 